It's a great pleasure to come to you today to prevent to present a long-term success story. And uh, just to remind the audience, the number one preventable cause of death after surgery is a fatal pulmonary embolism. We have plenty of data, 146 trials, thousands of patients over 35 years. We have algorithms and we use the Caprini algorithm, although it's not the only road to Rome, there are other ways to do it, but an established algorithm that will provide prophylaxis to those people and lower the death rate to a half a percent. The problem has been implementation and getting people to do that over a long period of time is a very difficult challenge. And today's story is about how one university and a whole team of people headed by Dr. David McEnany, who's the, the, the uh, chief medical officer of uh, Boston Medical Center. But he has a whole collection of people around him that are fervently interested in this. And uh, they were able to accomplish both taking the algorithm and um, applying it without a, a lot of yelling and screaming and producing outstanding results over uh, a decade. And, and I would just like to begin uh, by talking about Dr. McEnany because uh, he received the Nathan Smith Award, which is created to honor those members of the New England Surgical Society who demonstrated exceptional leadership and service in surgery throughout their career. And I'm quoting, Dr. Giles Whalen, who's chief division of surgical oncology, professor of surgery, UMass Medical School, and past president of the New England Surgical Society. And he said, and I quote, today it's my privilege to give this award to David McEnany, a graduate of Georgetown University's undergraduate college and medical school. He has spent his entire career at Boston and the Boston Medical Center and its predecessors, Boston City Hospital and University Hospital. Dr. McEnany is known for his excellence across a broad range of complex surgical oncology and endocrine surgery, on which he has not only published extensively, for which he has been recognized by the group who tend to know us best, our residents and students, as a teacher par excellence. He has won the Teacher of the Year Award on multiple occasions. He has also been deeply involved in the science of changing processes and habits habits to decrease the likelihood of complications, whether in endocrine surgery uh, or in surgery in general. I believe this is what is meant by such sought after expertise of implementation science these days. He's led a quality improvement program at BMC that has achieved national and even international acclaim for sustained improvements in the rates of venous thromboembolism and pulmonary complications. This sort of success takes high level interpersonal skills and ex executive ability, which Dr. McEnany has in spades. We have all taken advantage. He has served BMC and BU Medical School in multiple administrative and leadership capacities over the years, whether on the board of trustees or his current position of chief medical officer. He's a recent past president of the Boston Surgical Society and has served on our New England Surgical Society as a trustee and then president of the New England Surgical Society Scholars Foundation. He is currently our Massachusetts state representative on the executive committee and Dr. McEnany is a respected surgeon who is congenial and effective and has made a real difference in our world. I can think of no one more deserving of this author. And Dave, I've known you for a long time and I apologize because you're too humble. You'd have just preferred that this never be read, but I think that you've really accomplished something great. And the other thing that I noticed is that I've had the privilege to work with some of your residents, uh, Spencer Wilson and others. And they're, they're really, really incredibly brilliant people. And I would, as, I would say that what we're going to hear now about Boston University has been a big team concept with a lot of important people that have really been fervent about preventing thromboembolism and keeping and establishing a safe network for their patients. And I'd remind you, I believe Boston Medical Center is the number one uh, safety net hospital in the New England area, responsible also for the care of indigents. This isn't just a, a high profile, uh, rich only hospital. These people take care of everyone. 
And I think that's key. And that's what we have to understand about this whole program. David, it's been a pleasure to know you all these years. And I would uh, thank you for all of your efforts and uh, ask you to introduce our special, special guest. Absolutely. Dr. Caprini, I'm going to charge you with writing my obituary. Uh, <laughs> You and you and Dr. Whalen are, uh, are, are too generous. Uh, so uh, we're blessed here to have had uh, uh, support for five research fellows. Now these are all general surgery residents who take off a couple years to conduct research in quality and patient safety. And Anna Kobzova Herzog is our fifth in that line, if I uh, if I'm counting correctly, and. Uh, each of these fellows has had a different interest, but the common thread throughout their time has been our support of the Caprini uh, protocol that Anne is going to describe to you. And we thought it was about time that we looked at our 10-year uh, experience with how we've done. We started off by presenting a paper at the New England Surgical Society several years ago that showcased our early results with the Caprini protocol. And Anna is now going to summarize uh, what we've done since then. As many of you know, it's it's easy to have early wins with a quality improvement project, uh, but sustaining those wins over time is, is what counts. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kobz of Herzog, who will reprise her recent presentation at the New England Surgical Society, where she uh, earned first prize in the short presentation category. So Dr. Kobz of Herzog, take it away. Thank you, Dr. McNaney, for that kind introduction. I'll present our work titled Sustained Success of a Caprini Postoperative Venous Thromboembolism Prevention Protocol Over the Last Decade. We have no conflicts or of interest to disclose. In 2009, Boston Medical Center was a high outlier for postoperative VTE, according to NISQIP data. At that time, a patient on the general surgery service was three times more likely to have a postoperative VTE event than predicted. That outcome corresponded to the 10th decile, which is the least favorable. In response, in 2011, we created a VTE risk assessment model in the electronic medical record and mandated scoring of all patients undergoing operations. The protocol calculates a Caprini score that applies a numerical scale to estimate a patient's relative risk of developing a VTE based upon various individual factors and proposes risk commensurate VTE prophylaxis. This also included high-risk patients continuing prophylaxis after discharge. At the 2013 New England Surgical Society meeting, we presented early positive results of our intervention. Given the program's initial success, our objective was to review the long-term efficacy of a post-operative VTE prevention program 10 years after its implementation. This was a retrospective review of NISQIP data from July 2008 to December 2022 of adult patients who underwent general surgery operations. The primary outcome of this study was the risk-adjusted ratio for VTE. Measured outcomes in NISQIP are ranged from 1st to 10th decile, with the 10th decile representing the highest frequency of observed events of a specific complication related to expected events. And as you can see here, in 2009, the likelihood of a postoperative VTE event for a patient on the general surgery service was approximately 3.02 for its odds ratio. Following this, there was a departmental effort to standardize the VTE prophylaxis, and there was an incremental improvement in odds ratios following this. In early 2011, we completed the implementation of the VTE prophylaxis protocol and you can see a steady improvement in postoperative VTE events with odds ratios less than one for several years. You can see in 2015, there was a slight increase in the odds ratios close to one, which correlates to when we switched electronic medical record systems. And since 2015, we have consistently had postoperative VTE events at or below the expected rate for our institution, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, our institution ranked in the first decile for 11 out of the 20 reporting periods and ranked in the top three deciles for 15 of the 20 reporting periods from 2009 to 2022. Overall, our group standardized a protocol that has significantly reduced the likelihood of postoperative VTE events in general surgery patients over the past decade. 
This program has yielded overall strong, consistent results thanks to the protocol being embedded in the electronic medical record. We continue to refine this protocol to further reduce the likelihood of VTE events, including low molecular weight heparin dose escalation for patients at highest risk for VTE. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, lovely presentation. And uh, I would remind the audience that uh, there's a previous uh, YouTube video that we've done where uh, Dr. McEnany and Spencer Wilson present the nuts and bolts of this long-term program. But I'd remind the audience that what was involved here was giving the patient seven to 10 days of, of, of low molecular weight heparin injections if they had a score of five to eight, didn't make any difference when they went home. And the reason is that it's very clear in the in the literature of, of uh, trials, the effic period of efficacy is seven to 10 days. And then if their score was, was nine and above, they got 30 days of prophylaxis. And uh, it's really remarkable that not only, so not only did this happen initially, but it was able to be sustained over all of these years. And so, uh, in light of that, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. McEnany, how, how were you able to sustain this over this long period of time uh, uh, with a variety of doctors that you have uh, at the hospital? Well, thanks for the question, Dr. Caprini. Early on, as, as you can tell from uh, Dr. Cubs of uh, Herzog's presentation, uh, we had a captive audience. When you're Odds ratio of a VTE event, or in this case, early on, we were using observed to expected ratios. When you're around three, your patients are three times more likely to get a VTE than they would be expected based on their severities of illnesses. And so our surgeons obviously did not like that. Uh, they were quite motivated for us to fix the problem and were receptive to uh, all of the things that we recommended. So that was the easy part. Uh, they really gave us carte blanche to design a program and, and they all signed on. I think for longer term, uh, as new surgeons come and go, new residents come and go, it's having established the culture of safety, the culture of success. Uh, PAs teach new PAs, residents teach new residents and, and uh, the new faculty learn about this as part of their onboarding. Uh, so it really uh, breeds a sense of pride in the program and the success it's had over a full decade. And, and that encourages others to uh, maintain that, that, uh, that culture. Uh, so that's not been so difficult. The other thing that's made it easy, uh, relatively easy, is having this uh, built into the electronic medical record. If you look at other projects that we've done that require a lot of uh, engagement of the frontline uh, teams as far as hands-on patient care, specifically mobilization of patients. That's tough work, and that's tough to sustain. This, on the other hand, is something that, that's designed to be in the electronic medical record, uh, and there's a certain uh, automatic nature to it where uh, all of these reminders are generated. Uh, when we change EMRs, as you saw uh, back around 2015, we lost some of the advantages of the first uh, electronic medical record we had used, and it took a while to adapt to the next one. And so we had a brief lapse, as, as Anna nicely demonstrated on, on her graph. Uh, however, once we worked out the kinks of, of switching to a new system, uh, we really uh, got things back in line and were pleased with uh, uh, the degree to which we could automate all of this. Uh, so it, it's been a real pleasure to sustain this over the years. And it's really on the back of the residents, the PAs and, and the faculty who have done this work and have agreed to, to participate in it. We've also built a lot of reminders in this system uh, to remind people to uh, risk assess patients pre-op to reassess them after the operation in case things change. For example, they might discover, the surgeon may discover a malignancy, uh, or, or even at discharge, a reminder effectively saying this patient, don't forget, has a very high Caprini score. 
and should probably get uh, prophylaxis at home. And I'll also say that these are reminders that uh, we do mandate scoring patients. We do not mandate the prophylaxis. It's obviously encouraged, uh, but there will be situations where the surgeon believes that the risks of anticoagulation outweigh the benefits. And we've even built something into the EMR that allows the surgeon and the team to check off the reasons for declination, such as the, the risks of anticoagulation outweigh the benefits, et cetera. Um, so I hope that helps you, Dr. Caprini. Yes, and I want to emphasize something else, which in all the publications I've seen with the scoring systems, whether it's Caprini, Padua, Improve, uh, Kucher, whatever it is, that oftentimes people assess people on admission, but then they forget about it. And, and uh, the dynamic nature of risk assessment tools is absolutely critical, as you pointed out. And also, I would like to encourage the audience, if you're going to assess people, use the tool that works for you, but you must uh, assess that as it goes along. Now, I'd like to bring up another little problem. It's not so little. And that is, first of all, as I said, you're the number one safety net hospital in the New England area and responsible for care of the indigents. And yet you're prescribing 30 days of an expensive drug to some of these people. And also those of us that are over 65 and on Medicare and subject to the donut hole, that may cost us $1,500. Given all of these problems, how did you get this whole thing to work? Well, early on, we looked at the barriers uh, to sending the high highest uh, risk patients home on VT prophylaxis. And by virtue of uh, our payment system, we determined that what we were using at that time was more costly for outpatient care and much less expensive for inpatient care. We actually switched our types of uh, low molecular weight heparin so that it would be the converse. So we accepted a, a bit higher cost in the inpatient setting to decrease the cost in the outpatient setting. And also we're the beneficiaries of, of the uh, 340B uh, drug pricing program uh, that's helped us afford uh, being able to do this for all of our patients. Obviously, if someone has insurance, that's one matter, but uh, we're predominantly uh, government insured and very heavily Medicaid uh, insured at Boston Medical Center. And so the 340B program was uh, really a godsend for us to be able to uh, accomplish this program. I would like to next address have addressed a problem uh, by both Anna and you uh, regarding what are your recommendations for other hospitals, other healthcare systems? Anna, you want to start? Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. So, you know, I, I think it's, it can be daunting, uh, you know, to create a new protocol or a new program at any institution when you're trying to make improvements in patient care and patient outcomes. Um, and, you know, first thing is always to look at your own numbers at your institution. And, you know, the NISQIP is a great option to do that. Um, you can, you know, see how you're comparing and how your patients are doing. With that being said, if how you're performing is at or below what the expected rate would be, for example, for VTE, uh, for your surgical patients, um, it might be you know, more useful to try to use your resources to address other issues uh, that may be happening at your hospital or that could um, have a greater impact. However, if VTE is something that is heavily impacted at your institution and you example had a similar situation to what we had at Boston Medical Center back in 2009, uh, where patients were three times more likely to have you know, VTE, I would suggest, you know, not, not only modeling a similar type of program that we have here, uh, but also, you know, making sure that it's something that can be standardized um, and automated, but also individualized. And so, um, you know, like, what do I mean when I say that? So standardized, meaning you're using a standardized, either, you know, Capri score, for example, um, or other well-known scores that not only look at um, a set 
uh, scoring system that looks at individual patient factors, including comorbidities, past surgical histories, as well as looking at events that had happened during a patient's admission, such as the type of surgery they had, um, if you know, if they've had an additional infection or end up having sepsis while they were admitted. And so standardized in the fact that it is part of a system that you look through, you mandate the scoring for the patient, but also look at each patient individually to see if they have a higher risk or lower risk. Um, you know, and with that, you're able to slowly establish that as part of the culture of your institution, as Dr. McEnany had alluded to earlier. Thank you. Dave? She nailed it, Dr. Caprini. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, uh, we might summarize this by saying that uh, it's important, first of all, to find out what your numbers are in your own institution. That's number one. Number two is what are your resources? What are your available tools? How are you really able to incorporate them? Not everybody can rubber stamp the Boston program. It'll vary. I've always referred to this as the poster child of, of the uh, for the USA. And, and, and my only defense in that is you've written 17 papers on this. And now probably paper 18 is going to document the, I think it's the 12-year results, not the 10-year. And so I think you deserve that title, but that's not for everyone. So I think it's important for each institution to know what their baseline is, what their available resources are. They must ask all the questions. That's the other thing I see missing. And especially the obstetrical events. The women, just like in many other areas, have been underserved. You show me one other risk assessment tool in the world that has obstetrical complications in it. And that's just an example. And yet they're very important. And if you run into that, then uh, you have a very serious situation. I just came come across, I have a very brilliant um, successor, Alfonso Tafur. He's uh, younger than me, smarter than me, photographic memory, and thinks outside of the box, also has his MBA, a magnificent uh, uh, indivi and skilled individual. And he wrote me a note last week and he said, aha, Caprini was right. And he found this article where not only women who have had uh, 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 repeated unplanned abortions uh, have and have a positive antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, but also people who don't, this is a woman that has uh, an abortion uh, unplanned and then gets tested and is negative, they showed a study where there's still an increased incidence of venous thrombosis. So this is a very important thing. And you take a young person like Anna, she fractures her leg, they put her in a cast, uh, unbeknownst to her, her uh, uh, let's say she was a little older, married and had, had one of these complications and nobody asked her, that could be the difference between life and death. So anyway, it's been a great pleasure to have all of you here. I, uh, I certainly hope that this, uh, the audience will enjoy uh, listening to all of this. And uh, we always welcome any questions or comments. I have a website and uh, you can always ask me a question. So again, Anna and David, thank you so very, very much for uh, presenting your data and giving us your insights on this wonderful program at Boston Medical Center. Thank you very much. And everybody have a great day.